Should I start? Uh, or wait? <laughs> Where is Nilish? Jeremy! Ben, Jeremy! Can you come in for that one? Like, yeah. So we do class every day for the fellows, and uh, the, the person, the fellow who comes last, Guess the first question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think that's all of them except for one who's making the coffee. Okay. So we are actually from uh, UMC, uh, and um, we have Dr. Omar Al Tawil, who is our fellow, third year, and then uh, Dr. Nilish Gupta will be joining us. And Cheryl, our um, cardiovascular coordinator, also is here. And uh, we actually appreciate very much that uh, you invited us to come and talk to you. And uh, I wanted to give you a compliment first, because oh, we owe you a lot, because you are what I call the first line defense. And I'll show you the case from this weekend. We compiled last minute, but uh, that will bring on the discussion, you know. And, and um, because you bring the patients, then we can take over from you. And uh, I call it like a handshake, like a warm handshake, because if it is a relay race, and, and it's kind of a choreography that we work as a team. The, the story begins when you pick up the patient. So a lot in there that how you picked up, what was the story, what was your assessment, and then we take on. So um, I'm starting here. Yeah? So this is from this weekend. Patient is 56 year old male. History of stents in the past, and then had a uh, story that he was walking with his wife, then tilted his head, fell down, 911, CPR, 10 minutes roughly, and then brought into the hospital, UMC. You guys actually thought that uh, UMC is uh, closer than Valley, so it came to UMC in the beginning. <laughs> and, then, and then this is the EKG after the CPR. Patient was intubated. Mentation is uncertain at this time. And this is the EKG. And there was similar EKG in the uh, ambulance. And, and uh, do you think they called it? STEMI? I did, of course, right? So what we do now, so we did the initial, um, what do you call the initial stabilization, return of circulation, mentation uncertain, intubated. We have blood pressure and heart rate, and uh, it's a big, big guy. And then the, the important story we got, and this is hugely helpful, that you actually told us that the wife told you patient had a stents, multiple stents, two years ago. Patient was not following with any, any physician and uh, non-compliance, and then had this problem. So that is a huge lead. And you can see that, that there, is, um, there is the stent, and you don't see the LED stent, there is any flow. So um, what we did is uh, we opened up the LED. So it brings up few questions. There is LV aneurysm, LV dysfunction, but this VFib is primarily in the setting of, and we did contrast echo to show that the LV is significantly decreased, and there is uh, the issue about the LV systolic dysfunction. We did an EKG in the cath lab also, but as you can imagine that there is a biphasic T. If you see that in the, out, in the ambulance and you call it, some people may say you're over calling. I would not tell that because it is better that you over call. This kind of 
biphasic STs, we call it Wallenstein, is very suggestive of significant LAD, proximal osteal LAD. So if you over, and I really appreciate if you over call, then under call. Because uh, we cannot be perfect, and it is difficult to say that we'll be perfect. It is ideal to be perfect, but in a clinical setting of cardiac arrest and this EKG, I, I'd rather have you call. And then so that in the back end, we can actually get ourselves organized. And that kind of a story, if you tell us, patient went down, stents in the past, intubated in the field, blood pressure now 80, we can in the back end get ourselves ready. But this is a disaster on the way. And then we can get our cath lab organized. I can tell the cath lab staff that we may need impeller support, intubation, and then get the respiratory ready. All these actually really helpful that we'll be saving time to benefit the patient. So this uh, LED was restored. The flow is good. So um, and then uh, kind of uh, kind of happy ending so far. But patient uh, still um, neurologically uh, struggling. Um, we have a bench setting that oxygenation is not a problem. We are thinking that we may be able to uh, get this uh, ventilator out, if not today, maybe tomorrow. Um, in some situations, it's a tough call. But you don't know this, how long the downtime is. And everybody has these issues with the ischemic uh, injury and anoxic encephalopathy. But current guidelines is that you take care of the STEMI patients. If there is concomitant problems, such as cardiogenic shock, severe acidosis, renal failure, coexistent other diseases, hospital, in the ER, we can assess those. But your job is that you call it, stabilize, bring it to us. And it is nice to have a live patient than a patient on continuing CPR. You know, that is difficult to take to the cath lab. And I, as a rule, try to have a five minutes of heart rate blood pressure before we take to the cath lab. It's very important. Similarly, 55-year-old, you know, this is the EKG, ST elevation 23 AVF. This is uh, like day in, day out, you deal with this. And then this is ST elevation in the precordial leads, significant ST elevation. There should not be any problem. So I wanted to give a message today that if the clinical story is overwhelming, indicative that this is MI, then you can give importance to that than the, the EKG part. You can say, I'm not convinced of the EKG, but I'm very convinced that this is an acute MI. On the other hand, the patient may, you know, young patient may say, I'm getting belly pain, I'm not sure, but the EKG is overwhelming and very convincing. Then you just call it and saying, his symptoms is probably downplaying, but the EKG is very convincing. So that way, we can prepare ourselves. And few things we need to know, the, the vitals, the oxygenation, and whether there is any need for intubation. Because I tell the fellows, if you are in doubt, intubate. Because we make things wor worse in the cath lab to get things better. I'm repeating this sentence one more time. We make things worse in the cath lab. As we are doing the balloon opening and stent, we give more ischemic time, and the patient may decompensate. We give iodine dye. Patient is not uh, going to tolerate if he's already borderline. So if you're in doubt, into bed, and then we'll go from there. So this is post perfusion. This is something commonly we see, and we don't worry about this. I just want to give you the basic, little basics that what we can perceive as ST elevation MI or acute MI is really that we understand the same thing, that is the really the plaque rupture, plaque erosion, and activation of the coagulation cascade, and the activation of the platelets. That give the compromise in the flow. There may be other situations that COPD patient, PCO2 is high, PO2 is low, anemia, 
you are getting non-specific state changes. Troponin may go high. That is maybe demand supply mismatch and troponin rise. We call it type 2 MI. The mechanism is not that. So I tell the these house staff, if the patient is coming with hemoglobin 5, troponin is 5,000, I don't want to see that you are giving blood transfusion and on the other hand giving heparin. That it, it should not be that way. The reason is this. That MI is a demand supply mismatch. That is not the MI, the heart attack, the myocardial infarction that you and I try to understand that it is an activation of the coagulation cascade and the platelet activation. And you deal with this by tackling this pathway, giving anticoagulation into platelets. And in the front line, you have this utmost responsibility and care, which you do so well, stabilize the patient. That whatever it takes. I was hearing you're talking about the pressors. You're talking about the care for the respiratory status. You're talking about the heart rate. All these are so important so that we can take on from you. And in the vast majority of the patients, they do well if we can do the timely intervention. But remember, we talk about the uh, STEMI versus non-STEMI. High risk non-STEMI. If you look at the graph, over time they catch up in terms of morbidity and mortality. So non-STEMI high risk we should also take care equally and with same kind of priority and importance. But most of the time, you deal with these patients with the non-STEMI probably less aggressively than the STEMI because there is a process in place you need to activate so that the timely perfusion can be ensured. Let me tell you this other anxiety that we have in the hospital, and we, I hear this all the time from the ER. They say that, and, and, and I wanted to make sure that we should not say they or us, or you or us. It is all one team. The report is that, oh, EMS activated. And I asked them, but what do you think? And the, and the ER doctor sometimes said, you know, if somebody like Dr. Ross Berkeley or uh, Dr. Davidson in uh, Bali, I'm just telling them they're good friends, they would not mind. If Davidson says, you don't need to come, but it's a high risk, I understand. And if Davidson said, are you on, come. I would not ask any other question because we have a, such a good understanding. I just politely ask, Dr. Day, this is a disaster or what? No, 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 it's a stable, don't worry, it's an inferior We're holding, that's one thing. But if it is a uh, disaster, so that will help me because I can then talk to the cat lab that this is a serious issue going on. So that makes a difference in the back end. I'm just giving you the, the psychology that works when we get a call. So sometimes what happens that you are not sure you over calling. I have make, uh, made these examples and that is called the STEMI and STEMI mimics. Meaning that it looks like a STEMI, but it's not a STEMI. But there are two parts in the STEMI diagnosis. One part is the observation of ST elevation. The other part is the MI part, the myocardial infarction. But it is difficult for you to assess this in the front line. If the patient is sick, then you, you, you worry less about the EKG, I told you, and focus on the stabilization. If it's the borderline, you can think about the differential, right? Because if the patient is not clinically behaving like an MI, but ST segment is high, blood pressure is high, it could be LVH-related ST elevation. But if the clinically suggestive, then put more weight on the clinical. If the patient is crashing, burning, hypotensive, huffing and puffing, cannot lie flat, these patients are sick. Even if you're wrong, it is better that you call so that we can get ourselves organized, OK? Um, and the, 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 uh, the data for the EMS, what is acceptable for false activation, right? So 15%, 20%, I don't have any problem. But the, the false positive, I take it. But false negative, I worry more, right? You did not call 
but it is significant. We had one this weekend, actually, a uh, true posterior MI. The fellow got it, but we took the patient and it was a circumflex. We, we fixed it. So it was a little hint. Story is overwhelmingly uh, suggestive of MI. We did seven, eight, nine leads, and it was all there. Okay. Uh, so th th this is STEMI or STEMI mimics? Mimic, why? OK, but look at the, so before you say that, that's what I'm showing you. The trick is, what's the story? I tell you, if this patient is coming to Las Vegas from Pittsburgh and has a cabbage in the past, and patient is having toe pain, and you got the ST elevation, it could be LV aneurysm. So clinical context, clinical context. Before you jump on and saying mimic, and if this patient, how about 55-year-old, everybody today I'm showing is 55-year-old male. Uh, chest pain, diaphoretic, short of breath, and this EKG. Mimics? No. No. OK. So what about this one? ST segment, elevation. <coughs> Story. R exactly. 55-year-old African-American gentleman seeing you uh, in uh, seeing us in the office. History of hypertension, diabetes, epilipidemia. Wife told him to come. You ask him, he said, I don't have any symptoms. Occasionally chest pain. Some people will call the ambulance and send the patient to the ER. Will you agree? Why not? Yeah, the yeah, and the pain is very atypical, not consistently with exertion, not not in rest, cannot tell occasionally, going on for six months, and explanation. If you are saying no, but in the front line, if the if the doc called for a STEMI, you have no choice, you just go there, right? But I'm saying that there is a doubt. What what, what is happening here? Look at the. ST elevation, 2, 3 AVF, precordial leads, right? Lead one also. So God is not that unkind to give STEMI in all three major epicardial arteries, you know? Uh, what can be kind of unkind, but. Um, and then this is, you know, the concave upwards, PR elevation. This is going to be acute pericarditis. Yeah, so. And what about this? The sinus rhythm, but QRS wide, looks like a pattern. What is it? No. What is huh? it? White, QRS. white QRS, but sinus rhythm QRS looks like wide here, lead one as well. Left bundle branch block. So left bundle branch block is a problem that new. New lab bundle, but what is the clinical context? If the patient is in the in the uh, casino and having fever, cough, and then for three days look worse is one story. But if the patient in the, the casino, 55 year old, out of town, diaphoretic, blood pressure now 60, then this lab bundle because we don't know it's new to you or new to the patient. I rather interpret that this is new to the patient, which has more significance. I had one patient you know, coming with this, and then who is your cardiologist? Oscar Marroquin from where? Pittsburgh. And I, I have not seen doctor, talked to Dr. Marroquin for eight years. My buddy from there, I said, do you know this? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a cabbage, left bundle. I said, okay. <laughs> so the who, so who, who, new to me, but old to the patient. And the clinical context doesn't match. So left bundle, and then you will hear about this Garbosa criteria. Remember, one or three. One sensitivity high, but specificity is low. So clinical context, clinical context, and say that this is left bundle is new to me. I have no old EKG to compare. But if the clinical context is chest pain, 10 out of 10, diaphoretic, it doesn't matter, Le uh, the old and new. You, the clinic, the STEMI, the ST elevation part, can be explained by the bundle, 
But the MI part is right in front of you. You cannot ignore that. But if the patient, this is another problem I have. Patient came into the ER because of the toe pain. And they did an EKG, and then they're calling us STEMI activation. I laugh. And then we had a classic patient came in from China, doesn't speak English. And I was like going there, and I was watching from distance. He is thinking, these guys are fools. They're, they're headless chicken. I don't have any chest pain, nothing. I came in for my toe pain. Why they're taking me to the cat lab? So, and indeed, he said that when the Chinese-speaking resident showed up, and he said, I don't know why they are, you know, they, why did these Americans are like this? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so this is clinical context, clinical context, clinical context, very important. What about this one? Story. See that? Now you are getting it. Story. So 55-year-old and coming, severe chest pain, getting worse. Diabetes, hypertension. Yeah. So look at this. EKG doesn't convince you, but it's not right. But the story is so overwhelming. You don't need to scratch your head. Call it. OK? What about this one? Patient is from dialysis and fatigue. <laughs> He's laughing. I know why you're laughing. <laughs> so uh, dialysis patient, fatigue. and. Uh, and then, because of the fatigue and the blood pressure after dialysis got 89, then blood pressure came to 100. They did an EKG and they got panicked, called 911. Diagnosis? Yeah, yes, yes. So if you see that, start treating. You know, yeah, very good. So this one. See, I, uh, my, I'm already successful for today. <laughs> yeah, you're asking that question. Yeah. So th that T-wave upright, the QRS up, and then it looks like depression, right? And then look at this, inferior flying. But this is infra-posterior. When you don't see anything inferior, it's the elevation. But see this pattern. I don't know whether I have one. That is called the true posterior. But it is maybe difficult. But the story is good then you may say that this is true posterior, I'm calling it. We can always so-called downgrade, ignore, the doctors can do whatever, but I want your sensitivity to go up. He said that this guy is not, this is the thing I also tell the fellows. If the critical care nurse tells me, doc, the patient doesn't look good, I get panicked. The nurse may not be able to figure out, but that statement from a critical care nurse doesn't look right. That makes me panic. Sinus tachycardia makes me panic because I don't know what is the underlying cause. We, our job is to figure it out. Could be PE, could be something. The vitals not right. It is a problem, right? With yeah. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like like this weekend we did it. So <laughs> yeah, and then remember that another thing. It is, horizontal ST depression or downsloping ST depression more suggestive of ischemia, an ischemic event, compared to upsloping ST that you see with the LVH. I would write that down. That a... Like this. Like this. This is a, uh, I, sh I shouldn't say this, but don't, don't think that I'm biased or anything. But we see this in the UMC, so I have to tell you this story. So 59-year-old. Uh, uses methamphetamine and uh, hypertension, uh, history of hypertension, does not take medications, came in with some vague chest pain, and then looks like okay. And then as you walk in, then patient now, you know, in the UMC, they're uh, you know, watching CNN and eating banana. So <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, what do you say? LVH, right? Sinus rhythm, see that? This voltage is huge. And look at the ST elevation here compared to the uh, ST segment that's the, what do you call this, uh, tombstone type. This is LVH related. But again, the clinical context is very important. Now, we sometimes say, and some of our cardiologists say, let's take the patient to the cath lab and have a look. Danger, danger is the following. 
that if it is explainable and the clinical situation is not, rushing to the cath lab is not freebie because this patient hypertensive heart disease may have renal failure and you are giving dye, you may cause complications and go into permanent renal failure and dialysis. So it is not freebie. We need to evaluate these patients seriously, you know? And, and on that line, that this is, a, look at this ST depression, right? This ST depression is not good. <laughs> this is horizontal ST segment depression. And, and, and sometimes it can be difficult, particularly little elderly and female patients. And the female patients may say epigastric pain, vague symptoms, and men notorious for uh, downplaying. So that I thought gas and this, that, and then took uh, uh, seats and, and, and not coming. So this is significant because, again, we did not do the other leads, back leads, and can we. But when you see this, recognize that true posterior, although rare, can happen. But the huge thing that you have is the patient right in front of you. And this is a patient um, uh, uh, who had previous cabbage and uh, missed a couple of medicine. Daughter is out of town, got uh, unhappy, the blood pressure like 100 uh, diastolic and 180 systolic. And then dad saying, I'm fine. But they called it anyway. Because the you know, son, they don't care. Daughters, they care. And then they are sometimes over, they overdo because they have a uh, feeling that I'm too much busy with my family. We can call it, you go in there, you saw this. What do you think? Differential. If you call it, I don't mind, but let me hear that you can give a differential. Previous history of cabbage. So remember, cabbage patient, elderly, they have more comorbidities. Who knows, TIA, stroke, kidney problems, so if you make this like STEMI and there is no evaluation, this patient may get into troubles with complications. Access may be a problem, iodine may cause. So all these needs to be evaluated and warned that this is a, and the patient may have, may have dementia, maybe uh, DNR, who knows. But this is a typical pattern, Q wave in the precordial leads and ST elevation and cabbage, the clinical scenario, more suggestive of LV aneurysm. And if you ask the patient, he says, I have no pain, nothing. But blood pressure was high, and the daughter got uh, concerned. And this is a patient, uh, many things can happen. Patient had a pacemaker, now he's saying, I'm OK. And then family came in over the weekend, saying that there is a little bit of swollen face aside, and they call the ambulance because the cardiologist on call is not answering the page. <laughs> Happens often, yes. And then you go there, you do an EKG, you see this EKG. Well, he's definitely yes, I like that. He's definitely getting paced, and he's a A paced, B paced the repolarization abnormality, you can't tell. So I leave it to you. you. If the clinical context is OK, you can say that the pace are paced beat, I cannot interpret. That's fine, because if you say that, the, the ER cannot argue with you. But the pace site is solid. I'm bringing the patient, you can evaluate. On the same token, uh, this is, what, what do you think? Yeah, but there is more into this. You can say I'll do invoke the garbosa, but before you, <laughs> but 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 before you do that, what is the thing? The lab bundle. What is it you say? Yes, <laughs> clinical context. How many times we'll be saying this? But that is the theme of the day: clinical context, right? Clinical context, and then think about this. You get worried because this tachycardia. 
So why somebody at home suddenly have sinus tachycardia, right? Sinus tachycardia, you, if, it is, if it is VF, I, I definitely worry. But the question is, that you know there is VF, it's shocking. But sign, if it is atrial fibrillation, atrial bladder, you know. But I get nervous when you don't know. And sinus tachycardia can be anything. This could be a pre-existing left bundle and now PE, or it could be uh, uh, sinus tachycardia with a new MI. And, and look at this. this. This looks really a problematic EKG. And then uh, same is left bundle, LAD, the clinical context, right? Any questions so far? No? So how about this one you saw? Story. story. Love it. OK. So story is that patient had a, a peritoneal dialysis, catheter change, belly hurting, and the EKG looks like this. Doesn't look like MI. Yeah, good. What do you think? This one. Can you go back to that? Yeah. Um, it's not that it's an attack, obviously, but are you concerned that, like, is he short of breath, or did he have any PD symptoms? Yeah. The, the yeah. But you are bringing the patient. Yeah. Is the docs who are way f overpaid? No, no, not overpaid. <laughs> 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 they, they can fix it. But at this sign as a right bundle, and also there is the R voltage is high. There is a right, probably right ventricular hypertrophy as well. So that needs to be taken uh, into account. You know, um, profound hypoxia. And we have seen this so many times in COVID time. Profound hypoxia and acidosis can also give EKG changes. Sometimes we call it like uh, what is the shark fin tail type, nasty looking. But then you correct this, this can get better. And we have seen this so many times in COVID time. But this is no brainer, right? And I, I, you'd be surprised how many times when I showed this to the residents, they don't look at the hyperkalemia. The diagnosis is there. And then they, somehow they ignore that. <laughs> so, and the reason I'm saying this, if you see this, and particularly we have a problem in EMC, and Cheryl, maybe you take a note, that we don't do blood gas and do a stat lab. The potassium takes time. So if you, if, if you are recognizing the, not recognizing this, patient may get into troubles by the time the labs come back. So once you see this, start treating. Start treating. And then this is, uh, um, I, I will just make it up. Uh, somebody from Thailand landed in Los Angeles had some chest pain, um, on and off. It was happening for the last three days. But now the pain is better. But the, uh, but the wife says, uh, check out. Went to local hospital, and then they did the EKG. First of all, I said, 34-year-old from Bangkok. <laughs> there was a lead. This is classic Brugada type EKG. Uh, we have been burned. We have co overcalled it, and then took the cat lab. There's nothing. Uh, so this you would consider semi equivalent. Yeah, semi mimics. So you want them to activate this or not? We want them to activate. First of all, if you are in doubt, activate. But I tell this to the fellow, and I'm telling you, just say the story as it is. This guy doesn't look that bad, but I did the EKG. I'm not sure. This it looks like ST elevation. The EKG part. You can have a look, but the clinical part, I'm not sure. Story is for last three days. Then, then the ER doc will figure out when you arrive there. You know? But what happens that the, this is our human tendency. The ER doc did not see it. EKG non-specific, troponin came positive, and then they are asking, particularly the ER residents, and we are residents now in Sunrise, Mount Everest, everywhere there are residents. And they said, do you have pain? No. And then they look at the EKG, second troponin, do you have pain? And they ask so many times, the patient gets, yes, I have pain. <laughs> so so the, the, but you also, you have a pair of eyes that you already are experienced. Particularly if it is bad, 
with the objective assessment, such as hypoxia, such as tachycardia, such as low blood pressure, these are hardly any reason to ignore. You know. So, and I, I just inflated this pattern on the left side, but this is important that we do this. Um, now, this is a this is actually a real story. Summerlin nurse, her dad had a um, uh, craniotomy and then um, had some chest pain, was in the rehab, brought to the emergency room, and this EKG, ST segment elevation, you can see, right? And, and then, uh, and then uh, your job is done, but I'm just telling you the, how important the clinical context. And then as I was driving, and it was rainy, and I remember, <laughs> and then I said, oh, traffic bad. I said, let me call. So when I call, I usually call the, uh, no offense, I usually call the nurse taking care of the patient, because you get the truest story. Doctors, they make up stories. They, yeah, uh, yeah. To, be, to be in line with what they are thinking. It's the intrinsic bias. So I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, you're coming for this study? They just code it. So if you just code it, what will be your next question? Story, I gave you the story. But what is the, any other question you want to ask? <coughs> Vitals, they, they, they coded, they did not shock, and the CPR, now the blood pressure like 90, and pulse ox like 80. Intubated. Intubated. I said, good job, intubated. <laughs> Something out of my way. But do you th can you think of anything? So this is ST elevation. This is very rare. But I asked a simple question. I said, what rhythm the patient was in? It was not VF. Acute, the, the, the cardiorespiratory arrest, if it is VF, it is more indicative of an ischemic event or LV bad. But if it is PEA or asystole, first of all, Asystole is a bad news. PA, PA is, you need to figure it out. All these that you know, you probably know more than I do. Um, the trauma, T, and all that, right? But the PA with the hypoxia, cardiac rehab, and then this pulmonary embolism is lively. So I said, well, why not I do this? Talk to the, immediately talk to the ER doc. I said, can you order a CTA uh, chest with contrast? And it was P, massive P. So that's important. So when you pick up, we really want to know what was the first rhythm as you arrive. So if it is late in the game and you see a systole, it is difficult to say what it is. But if you're in time, three to five minutes, and your first rhythm is VP and you shot, we really need to know. And for our electrophysiology guys, we need to have a rhythm strip. But usually, you don't do a mistake with the VP or, or sustained VT. But a rhythm strip will be helpful. Print it, document. But a, a shockable rhythm is very, very important um, for us. And um, so look at that. The pulmonary embolism can evolve in many ways. But nasty looking EKG, and I have another thing I tell you, but you can't quote me. The nastier the EKG, less likely ischemic. They have an intracranial bleed. The deep T wave inversions looks like oh, bad. It's less likely ischemic. It's intracranial event related. Yeah. Uh, lead one and three. Yeah. Actually, that's a very important point. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, tall R wave. You know, the tall R wave. And then you see that the nasty looking and what is the clinical context? And then importantly, this patient is, and I'm not going to ask uh, our fellow, but this patient did not have tachycardia. One of the, in the pyopoid study, which is the most likely the sinus tachycardia you see. Here, you may not see if it is a massive and hypoxia that lowers down the heart rate. And we see that all the time in the cath lab. As the patient getting hypoxic, heart rate dro stop, starts dropping. So, but th that's a side, side issue, but it's important. So, and this is something we should not miss. 
that you know the Wallenstein's biphasic, you have a an observation that it is T wave biphasic and the ST segment elevation, but the clinical context, call it. And, and if you know, you have seen this, you say that this is not obvious, but the patient is having chest pain, and then this looks like Wallens. This should not wait. You are bringing the patient on a Friday, and then they already left. Sometimes the ER doc may say, OK, we'll keep on aspirin, heparin, and then uh, do it on Monday. But well, two hours later, a B fever has. Not a good thing. So there are many ways you can look at this, uh, uh, the uh, clinical context business. And this is something that you may not see in the outside, but we see that all the time in the hospital setting, that neurosurgical ICU significant ischemia. And then you see that how it is evolving uh, ischemia. And, uh, and then we'll have to jump on. So this is a different story, but rarely you can see this. And the differential is, see the ugly looking T wave, hyperkalemia is a differential. In very early part of acute coronary insufficiency, you can get this called the, the sharp angle T prominence, called the D winter sign. It, if this is looks, I mean, doesn't it look like ugly? So, and the clinical context, call it, call it that. that and they can say, why, why is there still elevation? If the, and I give you this clue. If anybody ever says, what is the ST elevation? Why did you call it? Then if you say one thing, they will shut their mouth. Clinically looking like an MI. That's why I called it. And then and if, if, if I'm calling this, and this is I teach the ER resident, if the, some of my partners will be, you send me the EKG, and then call back. What is the ST elevation? Why are you calling the ST? It's 2 o'clock in the morning, right? They're they are not happy. And I tell, I tell the resident, read the psychology of the cardiology. Say, sir, I don't see the ST elevation that much, but the clinical, he looks awful. Remember, cardiologist is not in the hospital. I am. I'm the resident. And I am describing you the patient is sick. By medical stuff, by laws, it is your job to figure it out because I'm, I'm just reporting you. And then they will backtrack. Oh, well, yeah. Give this. Do you think we can give heparin, aspirin, and re repeat EKG and see whether we can salvage? Because he's trying to. Uh, I'm in that end. We are trying to not come. <laughs> see, see that. But you always emphasize the clinical part and the evaluation, and then say that I did give the aspirin, heparin. Started on nitroglycerin. His blood pressure like dropped. And I cannot continue nitroglycerin, but his chest pain is not going away. What do you want me to do? So same thing, this acute, de see that? The nasty looking, yeah? So this patient is dialysis, maybe hyperkalemia. This patient is never seen dialysis, never had a problem. Now having 10 out of 10 chest pain, it is time. So one time, one time I had this question. I was half asleep and fellow calling me. Said, I said, do you have any family history? I said, yeah. What happened? His dad had an MI at 46. I said, how old is he? I said, 48. I said, OK, it's time. <laughs> Let's move. OK, so um, and then we went through this. Now, um, the, there are more EKGs that you can look at. There are, and then this is often we see, and hypothermia business. Uh, you see this uh, late winter. We see few of these. Um, and then so-called the Osborne wave, the bradycardia hypothermia um, is not uncommon. Um, but you can just tell in totality. Say that I found this patient. Rectal temperature is 92. The EKG doesn't look right. I'm not sure. Then. We'll figure it out. That information is important. So there are many, but if there are many uh, ways you can look at the ST elevation, but what I was trying to tell you, there are many causes of ST elevation. ST elevation is not synonymous with STEMI. Their ST elevation can be LV aneurysm, could be LVH, could be hyperkalemia, could be rare, rare pulmonary embolism could be uh, uh, ST elevation with the other, like lip bundle. It could be uh, 
ST elevation associated with Brugada. But you, if you don't remember all these differential, at least you know the patient in front of you. And the clinical context supersedes everything. OK? So just to give you a perspective that ST elevation and the pace rhythm, pace rhythm, so like pace rhythm is a problem. And some people say you can probably invoke the group garbosa in the pace rhythm as well. But the sensitivity and specificity neither can be uh, high enough to call for it. What will make the difference is the clinical story and the hemodynamics and the vitals. And uh, that's very important. Um, then the another interesting thing in this is the, uh, uh, the, the time course that um, if, if you do a repeat EKG, and if that, there is a change. Uh, and that's what they do in the ER. Um, so you can see there's a lot of differential, but you can simplify this. That the, the, if the clinical context is overwhelming, then it is better to call it. So the criteria is there. But when I tell people that you know the criteria, if it is 0.25 versus 0.15, you're not going to argue with that. You, you look at the clinical context. Right? And then pattern. Um, so 58 year old. Um, so now you are the expert. Now you say, I am calling it this to a reverse role. I am calling it a STEMI from the field. And you are in the ER. You are the physician. What do you do with this patient? Will you, will, you, will you let the STEMI continue and let the cardiologist come in? Or you will say, I will evaluate further. I'll I'll call it off. Ah, loved it. With, uh, so see that? I did not say further. The patient coming with chest pain, 10 out of 10 chest pain, tossing around. You know. And the patients, you know, in my view, the STEMI patients, they don't watch CNN or, or they, don't wa they don't eat bananas. Uh, they really are, and then, you, because this is a signal that I'm on my way to God. So uh, that, that is like tight, heavy, and they, they become numb. They'd, and they don't cry loud. STEMI patients, you will hardly see l l cry loud. There are a few tips I give to the fellows. As you walk in, you can see. The, um, so this, this is obvious, right? So, and, and not only that, this is actually very, very worrisome. Huh? So RCA closed, LAD closed, and then we had to do all the, um, but we had to open both anyway, um, in the temporary wire. But that evaluation was important. And this is a really an important issue because every other bit, there was a PVC, and there was ST elevation on the inferior lead and the, and the anterior precordial leads. What happened? Uh, uh, I think the file did not get carried. That's why. No, uh, OK, anyway. So, so with the reperfusion in a timely fashion made the, all the difference, you know? Um, um, so any question? OK. And then the left bundle, yeah. So non-STEMI, um, I would not worry, because we don't have the pressure um, in terms of achieving dot to balloon and reperfusion. But early, reperfusion has shown benefit. But let's make sure that we understand each other, even in the hospital, among doctors. If it is a non-STEMI, troponin rise. Troponin has been helpful, and it has also shown us to heart as well. The reason is, if it is not a type 1 MI, which is plaque rupture, plaque erosion, and the pathophysiologically coagulation activation and platelet activation giving rise to the myocardial necrosis, that is type 1 
where reperfusion and aggressive therapy will help. But if it is a COPD hypoxia, COVID pneumonia hypoxia, demand supply mismatch, and troponin rise, that will not be helped by the anticoagulation antiplatelet. So the mechanism of MI to understand is huge. And type 2 MI is a mixed bag. And we need to figure out who in the type 2 will benefit for devascularization. Type 1 MI, by definition, includes STEMI and non-STEMI. But that non-STEMI is the one that has been there because of the plaque rupture, plaque erosion, and then the arterial wall pathology giving this problem. Not that anemia giving five of hemoglobin giving the demand supply mismatch. Then you need to address the underlying issue. So type two is the rest of the world. Type two is difficult to, to find out what is the underlying re reason that I should address. Not anticoagulation, anticoagulation, cath lab. Yeah, yeah. We have troponin and we have no ST changes. But the good thing is that you are not asked to call a STEMI on those patients. This is, you're saying troponin high, and the ER doc is saying should be transferred to a PCI hospital, and I'm bringing the patient. That's it. On the way, if they missed it and there is a change in vitals, do you repeat EKG, and that ST segment now is changing, then you can call it. I don't see a ST elevation, but I see a dynamic change. Or on the way, patient has sustained VT or non-sustained VT, or went into decompensation and shock. That is a real problem. Yeah. So right bundle is, um, is something that should not be on the way, because you, we can read ST changes in the presence of right bundle which is unlikely the case for lab bundle. In lab bundle, you need to invoke the Garbosa criteria. Here you can see the right bundle did show. And this is not a big issue because the inferior was pretty obvious. And here, it is right bundle, but the ST elevation is pretty noticeable. So it's very convincing that the, the and, and, and look at this, the right, the inferior ST elevation with the RCA, young patients, they usually do well. But those who are hypotensive with the right inferior MI and RV infraction, their prognosis is pretty bad. So it is very important. Yeah. And this is a tough one. So I deliberately put this on for you. If you see this, will you call it? Yes. Yes. What's the story? So uh, story right, call it. So, but what is the worrisome part? Yeah, AVR worrisome. What else is worrisome? The rhythm is not regular. Tachycardia is a worrisome. So many things are worrisome in that. Yeah. So these are all right bundle related. OK. And I showed you the, uh, the uh, pulmonary embolism and right bundle. But clinical uh, context is very important. I showed you the hyperkalemia. Now, this one. So the issue is that how important is the clinical part, right? 37-year-old, motor vehicle accident, and then severe chest pain, blood pressure drop. They did not give lytics, thanks God. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there are scientists all over, and they just jump on the, you know, it's a remote area. They give lytics and then say, you know, it 
but here look at this ST elevation global, right? Global. Uh, and this is a traumatic injury, pericarditis, and the patient is getting pericardial effusion. So echo is mandatory. Yeah. And then another thing I tell the fellow is that uh, you, you are not allowed to, or you don't do ultrasound, fast ultrasound. And, and I'm trying to, and I come originally from Bangladesh, and I'm with the World Heart Federation, we are now championing that how we can take the care, bringing science where it is needed. The EKG and then ultrasound, that tells a lot, right? You talk about Bangladesh, you know, the mortality can be high because they don't have any access. How about Nevada? Do you know that we did a study here where we showed that those who have the geographic disadvantage and do not have access to you guys, or there is a delay, and did not get the proper access in time, their MI mortality was five times more. And what we did, we did pull the data, some of our fellows did a, a good job, and then geographic uh, coding with the, with the diagnosis and the coding, and it is mind boggling to see that when there is a geography, not in Las Vegas area or Reno, the rest of the state is really stretched and they get, get a real high mortality just because of the geographic disadvantage. So we need to think about this, how we can bring the whole population. We need to have a, the technology is there, the, the snapshot EKG and the clinical context and then call us directly and then find out where we can take this patient earlier to get this uh, uh, reperfusion and then that will help. So um, any other question? So how much time we have? OK. So what do you want to do? <laughs> OK, story is bad. So call it. <laughs> Patient is not doing well. Call it. You make it very simple, right? And then give the, give the story as it is that this patient was not doing well. I see the, there is a the right bundle, but the ST segment is flying. And then this is the part I say, see that? There is a, and then that looks like shark fin. This shark fin phenomena, and we have seen this so many times in COVID time, that may mimic, and the clinical context is very important. When we were told that COVID in the early part, do not take to the cath lab, that give lytics, and then try not to expose the cath lab, it did not work. Uh, we in UMC, I'm proud to say, we did not give any single lytics, even in COVID time. We had the paper, mask, but we said this is not good. And then American College of Cardiology, I'm the current governor of the state, and I, to, I refuted to say that just go with the lytics, because it's not going to work. And my partners are telling me, because they go, they give lytics, in another hospital, and we actually published a book, we reported. Few hours later, all thrombus coming back again with lytics. The reocclusion was high. So it didn't work. So then, then why you go for this? The, the tenecteplase or retaplase, retavas, or you can give streptokinase. It is so bad. You know, I was trained in England. We used to give streptokinase and cost and you know, TPA, which one you give. Our fellows, they don't even know the lytics because they all go to primary PCI. That's sad. I actually teach them for lytics to prepare them for the board, but not in UMC. We don't give, we don't give lytics. Um, although we need to know because now the stroke, you guys also deal with that. Early, early stroke treatment, you give lytics in early hours, you can get reperfusion. Yeah. So, and, and if you see this ever, uh, and now we have published, I can say this now. This, see this shark fin? This, see that looks like shark fin, right? So this is actually a pretty bad prognosis in the, in the, when we see this. We pulled our data. Those who have this shark fin phenomena, their prognosis was awful, particularly in cardiogenic shark. So and, and look at this. You talk about shark fin, what is it? Looks like shark fin. Right? See that? This is pretty bad. I, 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 it, there's chilling sensation in my spine when I see this. I said, can I save this patient? It's really bad. And you don't have any time. You need to move fast. 
move fast and also be realistic to give the picture to the, the family. Don't ex raise the expectation. Give, uh, oh, I didn't realize this. Who did this? We published actually the data on the TARP bed. So we had uh, a, a single center study about it. There's only one patient who was in college for 13 patients. I think we have around 12 patients, and was the mortality was really high. So mostly LAD, but we can actually, I think, use button with the new factor, touch and go, I think we can yeah shark fin no okay. brugada is a, 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 a like a different pattern but this is uh, brugada yeah yeah but the pattern is and the brugada can be problematic but again if it is the clinical context is and and by the way the the patient of that i told you about the thailand in southeast asia the brugada is reported more they, they, they die in the sleep because of arrhythmias. So that's why I give the clue. In the board exam, they don't give that clue. Because if they give this clue, they, they will go to Brugada. Next. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this is the LAD. And uh, so this is like, uh, this is very, very important. And then there is another entity that we are also looking into that if you look at this, the, this is called the pectoral fin. That is also bad. The shark fin and then pectoral fin. The pectoral, uh, who did this? Uh, Shiver did it? Um, so pectoral fin also bad. This, this, th these are the patterns that you really need to. I think if you tell this to the ER, they will say, are you out of your mind? So don't tell this yet. Uh, but these are patterns that is not good. Another important thing I want to tell you, this is one of the reasons I'm showing you. This kind of ST segment, I tell them, move faster. I tell them, the, get the elevator and then make sure. Why? Because the higher the ST elevation, the chances of going into BFib is pretty, pretty bad. And this is a very emotional thing for me because um, my wife's uh, maternal uncle, lost, we lost him in the elevator. Yeah? And my buddy and my brother-in-law, 46, died of BFib arrest, because RCA. It was such a, like, only inferior, and there's no reason not to open it. But in a remote area, they could not recognize, went into BFib. The ST segment flying, you have no time. That three minutes in the, in the elevator, and then the, nobody did, uh, did this, uh, uh, hold it, then that can make a difference. It's very, very important. And you make sure that you tell the team, you tell the team that this is ugly, and we get uglier. So make sure that you're prepped, psychological. And uh, we, I tell the fellows that this is a teamwork. You need to tell the cat lab that who is coming. This is a, it's a way different than somebody elective case coming from home. We are prepping the groin. You have three hours to go slow. You know, but if it is coming like that, we need to move fast. Yeah. So and then you see that how the inferior lead and how the precordial leads. This this looks like the little shark pectoral fin type. I get worried. I get worried about this. So, but in, in any case, um, this is uh, this looks like pretty benign, right? Right? Pretty benign. Sixty-nine year old fell, chest pain, but few few things. We don't need to diagnose. You know, we we are not electrophysiologic cardiologist. If you say tachycardia, and say narrow complex, and say regular, I'm okay with that. Because white complex, you cannot say, oh, this is uh, 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 white complex tachycardia. Should, what should I do? Like, you know, or, and, and tachycardia in general. If you can't figure out, just pray. Please pass out. <laughs> then we can shock. <laughs> or drop blood pressure. Shock. <laughs> and then we'll figure out later. <laughs> right? So the prayer works. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you, prayer does work. So we are doing in the cath lab. And then uh, suddenly the cine does, the, the fluor doesn't work. Fluor doesn't work, right? And now in, in rota, we dissect it or not. And the team is very important. And the team member says, how about uh, some prayer? I said, yeah, do it. Go to respective God. Uh, and then a senior guy said, what about cine? Cine is more radiation, because we check, we check. 
and then we did uh, fluoro. Fluoro doesn't work. And then he says, but check Sini. I said, there are a lot of radiation. He said, who, who cares? And now Sini works. So I did the whole case with Sini. And then it came out good. <laughs> so sometimes you don't, never know. A team member who may come up with an idea that is great and uh, uh, is a teamwork. Cardiology, I can't tell you. The, uh, every time you bring a patient, we thank you. Because it is important that you're part of the team. And you are most welcome also to have a cup of coffee and then stay in the cath lab if you can afford that time. Um, but you can see that how it works. Because I need to know how you work, how your brain works, and you need to know what is our perspective, what we want you to do. And that's why I'm coming to talking to you. So tachycardia and then and the chest pain, not good. And the chest pain getting worse, not good. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> okay, now I, see? <laughs> so so that's the that's the issue. So 30 kg better, and then somehow the angiogram is working. Uh, prayer worked. <laughs> So, so, and then we reperfuse, you know. And this is a garbosa character you probably know by heart, you know. So anyway, um, so this one, like, it looks like all ST depression. You don't see any ST elevation, right? Yeah, there, but there is ST elevation there. You call it STEMI activation? Sure. And, and, and look at that. This is a high-grade lesion in the, in the LAD. It's almost like a hanging on a thread, see that? So, so these are the patients where we actually uh, uh, have more help um, and the patient survives. So these are the osteal LAD lesion. If you look at the middle panel, it's pretty obvious. Um, I should not say this, but uh, this is one of our, uh, yeah. Isolated AVR elevation is usually present or can be present in LVH. In the absence of LVH, isolated AVR is extremely rare, but the usual association with ST depression in the precordial leads. When that happens and the patient has chest pain, I, I, I say this and <laughs> one of the senior cardiologists says, uh, uh, wasn't very happy and I said, you can clinically smell left main, left main disease. And I tell the fellows, because it all depends whether you give the 2B3A uh, I mean, uh, oral antiplatelets, because in case they go to the OR, giving Plavix may be a compounding issue. These are the complex issues that we deal in the hospital. But the bottom line is that if the patient is elderly and then AVRST elevation, chest pain, precordial ST depression, this is a higher chance that this is left main multivessel. So this patient, and one of the problem of this patient is that if they drop blood pressure, then it is a spirally downhill course for going into cardiogenic shock. So that's why we need to be extra, extra careful. <clears throat> so uh, probably stop there and then, and th these are the uh, things that I just want to let you know that sometimes you wonder, you brought the patient and we're not taking to the cath lab. And I think in the United States, we need to prepare ourselves for addressing this issue about futility of care. Sometimes we overdo, because we don't tell the family. We maybe we ex raise the expectation. Look at this. This is all in the Journal of American College of Cardiology published literature. If the patient is shock, and then pH is bad, lactate high, patient on multiple pressors, more than 75 years age, comorbidities, and previous history of uh, stroke, TIA, kidney failure, their prognosis is pretty bad. The mortality can be as high as 80, 90%. And then in, in addition to that, if there is an issue come up, suddenly the patient is DNR, then, then it is, it's, a, it's a blessing. If it is not, then it's a problem. But what I tell the ER that we need to tell this to the patient the same thing. Because if the ER doctor says, oh, they, they should go to the ER, oh, uh, cath lab. I don't know why they are not taking. 
because his issue is that get this patient out of my ER. But that should not be the case. It is one team, and we should be realistic. Even if you're telling the patient and the cardiologist is taking to the cath lab, but the mortality is high, at least we recognize that. So these are a lot of things that come into interplay about how we pick up the patients, diagnose, give the reperfusion therapy, and take the patient uh, the care after the reperfusion. Any other question? Oh, yeah. And for Tony, can you talk to us about touch and go strategy when we do it with the EMS when we take the patient? Actually, oh, Cheryl is here. Thank you, Cheryl, for coming. And UMC, you know, um, Dr. David Slattery uh, and Dr. Ross Berkeley, um, I work closely with them. So we have done a few cases. And the best person, oh my god, I don't know why he retired, but he should retire, Dr. Dale Carrison. I don't know you know him. Uh, Dale, uh, Dale's language was different with me. Dale's language said, Chaudhary, come. <laughs> One word, <laughs> hardly any. I, and I then called back, because he just hung up. He didn't wait for me. Uh, so I just called back, and I talked to the nurses. You know, Dale called me, and what's the story? Is it disaster? Because you know, sometimes you never know. Should I get the kettle on, yes, have some cup of coffee, on, and then drive to the hospital? or? I just run, you know, uh, uh, it, it makes a difference to us. <laughs> so so, um, so uh, the touch and go, thanks for asking this, and Cheryl actually champions this, that if the ER doc, because you called it, if you are convinced, and then ER doc is convinced, and we are ready to take, then why we wait another 30 minutes to do uh, lots of things like headless chicken, the patient should stay go to the cath lab. There's no point not to go. And actually, I wanted to tell you another thing. Uh, maybe you hold on for that thought for a second. The, the touch and go means we evaluate. So question is, is it a STEMI? ST elevation and MI. And patient is hemodynamically stable, no need of intubation, blood pressure good, heart rate good. In, English language that is uncomplicated STEMI. And the patient is agreeable. There is no need for this patient to get off the gurney and then off the bed to gurney again. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. So, and you guys are very good. I have not come across any time, any single EMS crew so far has refused my request to go to the cath lab on gurney. That I thank you for that because I said that, hey, can you wait a little bit? We may be doing a touch and go. And if the ER doc says no issue, I don't have any issue, you don't have any issue, go. So we just go to the cath lab. That's what they are referring to as touch and go. Why that is important? Because there may be a delay. Remember, door to balloon is door to balloon. Door to balloon, and door to balloon is uh, less. The perfusion is achieved early. The mortality is favorable. But what about the first medical contact to the uh, balloon time? Because if you are late, then it's a problem. Access to healthcare, problem. Another important thing is the symptom to balloon time. If somebody already spent time like two hours, and then we are giving another 90 minutes, we are adding. So if you are convinced, now the patient thinking that the epigastric pain is uh, something to move on, and then you see inferior STEMI, then there is no reason uncomplicated STEMI should go to the cath lab right away. So that's the touch and go part. And, and that works pretty good. Our, um, and then <laughs> I should not say this, but our, our the, 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 the lowest time is what, 19 minutes? Uh, our, so yeah, that's mine. So that, that, that. so 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 they, they they told me that I cheated. Uh, 16 minutes. The reason I cheated because I got the call. So we were working on a negative time, meaning that you bring the patient, but you already called it inferior, right? So this young guy, and I we are ready there. So we rushed, and then Dr. Deep, my partner, he said, you you cheated. You that should not count. But it was fair game because we. We did the evaluation and we rushed, so there was no delay. Elevator ready and everything ready, and then stars and moons are aligned, meaning that chaos in the cath lab is in good mood, the cath lab is empty, the crew is ready. You know, there is no reason to waste time there. So we, 16 minutes, 
artery opened up. And there is a significant thing we see, and patients really uh, feel it. Once the, the artery is open, and you have probably seen this in the cath lab, they suddenly get relief and, and fall into sleep. Yeah, that's a very happy feeling. Those who goes to interventional cardiology, uh, my fellows, when they did the first or second STEMI, and they, they said that this is the reason I went to. I said, yes, you did. But make sure that this is a happy feeling. There will be time when there will be unhappy feeling. Get ready for that. So uh, I think we can stop here. We have a collection of cases, but I think we're running out of time. Are you guys doing the